and welcome to the containerization and meta programming session. My name is Robin. Hour and a quarter with four 15 minute talks, each followed by five minutes of QA. Please add your questions in the QA tab throughout each talk, and I'll pose them to the speakers after their presentations for the benefit of the video. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a definition of the topics two talks about containerization, the virtualization of computing environments to run applications in isolated user spaces called containers. This essentially lets us package our programs and their dependencies to run anywhere. And we have two talks about metaprogramming, where programs treat other programs as data, giving us programs that can read and write other programs. So we'll begin with Conrad Kramer. Conrad used R for scientific programming in his PhD and is now postdoc at the University of Karlsruhe, currently working on lab automation. And he'll be telling us about translating R into C++. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so I will present uh, how to translate R to C++. And I've written a package called us to us, which uh, can also be found on CRAN. And um, yeah, so what is the motivation and the aim for package for problem is if one uses R functions, which are called very often or which are called by C or C++ code. So there is, might be expensive copying of memory from R to C or C++ and vice versa. This is very inefficient. And what I've done here, these two box plots show a benchmark um, of, of an ODE system, which is solved by the R package R to Sundials. Um, the left box plot shows um, the ODE system implemented as a pure R function, whereas the right one shows uh, using Amadillo or RCPP to, um, to write the ODE system in C++. And as you can see, non, not surprisingly, the C++ code is much faster. So how to overcome the problem? So I, I was giving a talk about um, ODE parameter optimization of ODE systems, and the students really struggled using C++ to implement their, um, their ODE systems. So we come over with the idea we, we could try to, to write a transpiler from R to C++. And uh, we solved the problem using the R, uh, by, by creating for R package S to S. So now here are, it's the same benchmark. It's a, pretty simple ODE system, which is solved by R to Sundials. Now on the left side for R code and in the middle box plot again shows the C++ code and on the right box plot shows the result of a translated function of R to C++. So it is much more faster than R. It doesn't reach uh, for, C for speed of C++, but it gets near to it. So this is really good if you want uh, to use R functions in optimization or as ODE functions uh, for um, during ODE solving. So this was the scope of a package we intended to implement or I intended to implement. So um, in general, the, the package consists of two basic um, building blocks, one in C++ and one in R. And, and I will um, show you how um, show you both building blocks, but what happens at the C++ side. So this is the first building block. What I've done, I've written an expression template library, uh, in short, ETR. And this expression template library is uh, it's a C++ library, which mimics R. So it tries to be as close to R as possible. If you are not familiar with C++, um, you are having to be afraid. Just look at the lines 8 to 13. These are the relevant lines. The rest is just um, C++ dependencies and so on. So, but it's readable. So you define three variables. You can um, of type sex p, p, vec, and mat. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I have uh, the names are self-explaining. So p is 3.14, and then the vector is a, is one to four, one to three, four, and then you define a matrix. Um, with two columns, two rows, and each um, element is set to value five. And then you can 
use print to print some calculations. So you multiply P with a vector and um, then you uh, do some additions. So, and as you can see here for results, when you have one time P, two time P and so on. So this looks quite um, common. And if we compare it to our code, so I have now here on the left side for the same code and now on the right side for our code, and uh, you can see um, the same results of um, are, are uh, calculated. Um, as I mentioned, ETR tries to mimic R, and it is very close to R, but there are tiny differences. For example, here you see for print function prints here in R uh, raw vec, whereas in uh, the ETR the call vector is printed. So C++ and R code look very similar. So this is important because now the second building blocks come in. Um, the R code is translated to C++ or to, me, to be more precisely, it is translated to ETR. Um, what is done is uh, with a translation of R code, for example, if you have here uh, this easy expression, you create a vector from one to four and then you add the first element of A, which could be a vector. And using the package lobster, one can visualize the abstract syntax tree. Um, that was also why I came up with a name. Um, I, I, at the beginning of a project, I read a lot about transpilers and they all told you, okay, you have to, to um, translate one abstract syntax tree of one language into the abstract syntax tree of a second language. I think technically this is not exactly what I have done. Um, but um, at least I, I um, what I've done is I use the abstract syntax tree of R to translate it to ETR. So on the left side is for R abstract syntax tree. So you have you have a plus function which gets a result of a colon function and of a subset function. And the colon function gets two uh, arguments one and four, and the subset functions gets also two arguments a and one and uh, this cannot be compiled to C as plus plus as C isn't aware of a colon and the bracket operator. So um, what is done is uh, can be seen on the right side. Um, these functions uh, colon and um, index operator are replaced by colon and subset, and these functions are implemented in ETR, and this can now be trans uh, compiled to C plus plus. So to, to get an example of entire code, for example, you want to calculate the six first elements of a Fibonacci series, then you can just write the R functions, defin, defin, uh, define a vector, set the first two elements to one, and then you start the loop. And then you only need one function, or s uh, has only one function for the user, it, it's translate and it translate the function. Uh, there are two possibilities here. Either you translate it to an R function, which is set to true. So this is currently, if, uh, I've updated it recently to also get the possibility to get R functions. But um, if you want to get full speed, you can also uh, re um, um, create an external pointer to C++ function. And for right hand side, I've written the, um, the ETR code, which looks uh, yeah, a bit more complicated, but uh, but this is uh, what happens uh, behind the scenes. Um, and now I want to present some specific features of ETR, which are pretty useful, I think. Um, so first of all, we have interfaces with RCPP, so you can define a numeric vector and you can just stick it in um, into a sex p element. A variable and and vice versa, so you can um, can convert a six p element a variable to a numeric vector or to a numeric matrix. So this is also possible for RCPP armadillos, just for convenience. Uh, far more interesting is for pointer interface. So um, if you're not familiar with pointer, it is a possibility to um, yeah to manage the memory. And, um, and you can imagine that, that here the variable pointer is something like a vector, but um, you have to create the, the, the memory 
and then you have to delete it. So you are responsible as a programmer. And um, what can be done? You can create a sex p object using a pointer. Um, first of all, it needs for size of a memory, which is allocated when it needs for pointer. So for position for memory, and when it needs an, a third element, which is an integer. And this integer can be either zero, one, or two. In case it's zero, the, um, the elements of a pointer are just copied. So this is just a copy. Um, this is uh, quite boring, but the second possibility is a bit more interesting. So if you set it to one, then you take the ownership. This means that you don't should, uh, you, sh you aren't allowed to delete the memory now because this will be done by the destructor of this XP object. And um, yeah, and the third option, which is for far more interesting, is if you set the integer to two, this you borrow only the ownership. This means that you um, alter the memory, or you can alter the memory. Um, where the pointer is pointing to using this XP object. I have used this in the R package pair up where um, there is an optimization of ODE parameters. And um, the ODEs are solved using Sundials. And this is a C library. So the memory is, um, uh, yeah, well, is created and deleted by, by C pointers. And now there is the possibility that you have y and y dot, for example, and uh, I borrow only for pointers. So, uh, so what I mean is it is a shallow wrapper around the pointer, and thus uh, the user can do whatever he wants, and thereby changing the content of y and y dot. And I think this is pretty cool and pretty efficient for um, uh, for the use uh, yeah especially in the use case of solving ODE systems and um yeah with that said i would like to thank you very much for your attention and i would be happy if you get in contact you can uh, contact me on github conrad1991 uh, there's also my email address public or you can um uh, message me on on twitter kramer underscore conrad so thank you very much and have you any questions? I would be glad to answer them. Thanks, Conrad. We've already had a question in, in the q and I invite other people to um, submit further questions. Uh, if you don't get it in now, we can come back to those at this time at the end. Uh, Michelle Shorovsky has asked, how does AST to AST handle translating R functions from non-standard libraries? For example, functions from dflyer, pipeline operators, et cetera. Um, well, it, it only um, can translate a very tiny subset of R. Um, so, for example, um, math functions like uh, logarithm, trigonometric functions. Um, there is also an, a simple interpolation, but it will not translate uh, anything else. So, the use case I thought of is really for uh, writing functions for optimization or as ODE functions. And I think if you want to make, uh, if you want to analyze big data, so you, there are a bunch of other tools that can that can do this really great. So what would be involved in extending it to to handle um, other packages? Uh, well, um, yeah, maybe I I I think I I should. I never checked how the ask looks if I uh, use deployer functions or something else. So I, I would have to check this and maybe if there could be a way to do this actually. Uh, but I have to check first, yes. Okay, but presumably there's, it's more more templating and you have to write more yeah, code to, write... to extend it. The, the yeah. Um, Peter, since you're on the screen, do you want to just ask your question directly? <laughs> Sure, I was just wondering because you mentioned that it's focused on optimization. Have you also implemented the statistical density functions? Um, no, actually not. But uh, these functions I can add. So these are 
possible you mean uh, li like r uniform or something like that yes those sorts of yeah. things those functions are not yet implemented but this is easily to implement this is not a problem um currently i've um so for car yeah for, i didn't implement it because <laughs> there are many functions I, have, I had to write but yes this is possible and i think i uh, after that it, it's currently it's only a side project so it's a, a, my personal project now uh, because i've it's from my former job so um i it i will improve it but it will be going slower well, that's not being too modest, Conrad. It uh, sounds like an excellent beginning with um, with a lot of potential. Um, oh, one more question appeared. Um, uh, Patrice Goddard asks, what kind of outputs are supported? Um, well, as I mentioned, you, um, there are two possibilities. Either you get an external pointer, and uh, the external pointer um, either it only expects six P elements as arguments, or and can return a void or a 6p depending if whether you use return or not and um the other possibility is that you get an r function by rcpp but i think this um yeah i, I have uh, implemented it re um recently so i've it's not on cron yet um but you can install the github version if you want uh, if you want to use an r version uh, an r function great okay um i suggest we move on now to uh peter solomos peter is a senior data science open source developer and the co-founder of analytium solutions specializing in statistics and shiny Today, he'll share some best practice solutions for shiny apps with Docker. Yeah, I forgot to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Let me again. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this talk where I'm going to share some best practices for Shiny apps with Docker. And uh, I've been working with Shiny and Docker for over five years now. And uh, this is kind of the essence of what I've picked up along the way. So if you are working with Shiny, maybe then Shiny won't need any introduction. But let me start there before I go into why you might want to use Docker and uh, what kind of gotchas I can share with you so that your road becomes less bumpy. So in my opinion, uh, Shiny is the smartest abstraction ever because you can go from purely an R code to something what servers and clients and browsers can share with each other which is mostly just bytes coming and going and text files so all that abstraction which in me in the middle of this r code and text files that becomes really really complicated how uh, the javascript talks to the r process and all that and how this is put into a server framework and so shiny's uh, greatest strength is you can do this with minimal effort and whatever happens in the background that is mostly taken care of that package and also one of its dependencies which is called http uv which implements the server framework so really when you open up shiny in your browser locally or in our studio you're looking at that server which is sending you the output so how to do that that's an enormous feat and we are so lucky that that these tools exist so you can now learn about Shiny. And once you master Shiny, then you can still learn a bit more and you can then take all these great books that are out there and tutorials and videos and learn everything that you can, how to make your app production grade so that it won't fail tests. Users are going to be happy about that and you can also put this into a whole kind of a continuous integration pipeline. And they can also 
start improving your user interface a bit more, how to put more uh, interactivity to the client side so that the R process frees up resources so you can do more. So once you covered all of this, then you still are only 50% done because now it's all great, but you still need to host it somewhere. And of course, we all know there are a couple of options and this is where I'm going to talk about why you might want to think about Docker. Um, when you start looking for solutions, then the first thing that comes to mind, which I call these as conventional hosting options. So if you go to our studio website, who created uh, Shiny, then these are the prime options. And first one is a platform, shinyapps.io, which contains a free tier. And it's really easy to get started because it's integrated with our studio. There's a button. If you have a Shiny app open, then you just need to go through some sign up and authentication steps before you can click that button and uh, deploy consistently to the cloud. But this comes with limited uptime and a couple of other options that you might run into if you really want to take your Shiny up to the next level and you have like heavy usage by your users and you want uh, like custom domains as for your branding. Other options include, you can use the Shiny server open source version um, which is again free, but it's not so easy because now you're on your own to install it on a server. Then you need to manage these servers, uh, apply security patches, keep things up to date. And now Shiny apps are going to use your R processes on this server. So you might run into some difficulties with uh, keeping dependencies separate for multiple apps you might host. So that is not impossible. Actually, it's quite doable, but that is extra work. So you need to know how to approach these things so that your apps, whenever you update packages or are itself for one app's sake, how to make sure that other apps are still running fine. So that brings in some uh, additional overhead for making sure things are running okay that used to run fine in the past. Now, the third option might be the ultimate experience for the enterprise. But for this uh, non-free option, which has a, a price tag in the thousands, you get a lot more than just let me host sh some, some shiny apps. So if uh, you're working with a team who are delivering reports and run uh, cron jobs and everything else besides just uh, deploying and hosting shiny apps, then this might be a perfect option because this comes with great integration, not just with R, but everything else, including Python. However, if you're just looking at Shiny hosting on its own, then maybe this could be an overkill and a price tag that you might not be able to afford just for uh, the sake of uh, hosting a few Shiny apps. So if you want something more, unlimited uptime, no restriction on the number of apps, you want to have your own domain with security, and you also want this for not too expensive, um, then there are other options. And I've written some blog posts about this. You can see the conventional hosting options, which don't directly rely on Docker containers. Um, and all the other options, there are some which also don't utilize Docker. But in this column here, you can see quite a few options that are out there. Uh, you're better off if you learn how to put your Shiny app in a Docker container, because once you do that, then you can pretty much just decide where you want to host it from there because you can take that uh, Docker image and put it in any cloud that you'd like. And so this table also helps you once you have an idea about your constraints, how many apps you want, what is your budget, uh, do you know Docker, do you want like a platform where you don't really have to touch servers, and then what else you might want. So this table in the blog post, if you go there, it is going to be interactive so that you can filter this table and then you'll end up with a couple of options and then you can dig deeper and learn how to exactly do the shiny hosting for that particular option. So now we kind of know why we might want to use Docker in the first place, because it just opens up other possibilities for hosting uh, our shiny apps. So hello world. Uh, if you imagine that uh, um, histogram in the Hello World Shiny app, how that looks is you have a UI definition in R, your server input and output coming and going, and then you run that app 
And if you deploy that to uh, like a traditional virtual machine, then your R process is running on that server. And then through some port of that host, the client is going to communicate with your server. So what Docker does is it provides an isolation for your app. And now, as if you were like just cutting this out, now you can take this image and just put it in a different server, put it in a different cloud. And this is that isolation that Docker provides. And also it opens up uh, other possibilities. So now you're looking at the whole ecosystem. Once you build your image, then you can push it to a registry. And from that registry, uh, you can just pull that image and it will be available in any other servers. And once you take that image and run that image, that's how you create the container, which is a live instance of that image. That's what we are interacting with. So there are a couple of Docker comments, which I'm not going to talk about. The only thing I'm going to talk about is how to best make this image so that now once you have that image, you can move that around. And if it's working on your local machine, it is going to work anywhere else the same way. You just need to kind of make sure that uh, the client has access to that uh, container. So let's see, the key to creating this image either locally or as part of like a, a CI CD pipeline is to define a Docker file. This is a simple Docker file, which uh, follows some patterns, how usually all of the Docker files look like. So this is how we wrap up a shiny app as part of a Docker image. We need to pick a base image, which I'm going to talk about in a second, then define some uh, dependencies, then move the app into the image, so copy over the files, then expose some port that Shine is going to be running on, and then provide a comment at the end, uh, what is it that we want to run inside of that container when, when we make that live. So this is how the Docker file looks like. It's a simple text file, and you can now use this specification to build the image. So the first thing is pick a base image. You can start from, from scratch or pick a, a, an OS like Ubuntu or Debian or Alpine Linux, but then you'll have to install R and everything. We are so lucky because the Rocker project and other projects have provided us with uh, really wonderful uh, parent images, which already include a version of R. And I've tried a couple of these. Here are some results. So if I take, different base images and build the same shiny app, then this is what I'm pulling as the parent image, how big that is in gigabytes, and what is my final image looking like once I add the dependencies and the app itself. We go from R minimal, which is based on Alpine Linux. That is going to be the smallest, like 222 megabytes. And then we go up to beyond like 1.6 gigabytes when we use Rocker's uh, shiny image. Other images like our base is based on Debian. Then other images here you can see those are Ubuntu based. Their sizes are pretty comparable. Some are somewhat smaller than the others. So there's no huge gain or advantage in in terms of size. But in terms of build times, when we go from Alpine, where we really have to compile everything. And uh, here, based on Ubuntu, this is where we are not using binary packages. RStudio, RBase, and Rocker Shiny, these are using binary images. And then these new one instances, BSPM and R2U, these go one step further, not only binary images, but they resolve all the dependencies for the system packages and using uh, apt-get. So that's why this build time in terms of minutes goes or varies between half an hour to half a minute. And that's quite considerable if you have to do this again and again and again, uh, for example, in a CI CD pipeline. So you need to think about how to best pick uh, an image in terms of the size and the build times. So this is something to watch out for, but I personally like the Ubuntu based ones. And there are lots of different options in terms of what is already pre-installed and how bare bones you want to go with that. So now, once we have a base image, then we need to install some dependencies. 
and how we order them depends a lot when it comes to build times because um, the image build is cached. So whatever specification we haven't changed since last time, Docker, if those cache layers are still there, won't really touch these. So if we, for example, change our app, it is not going to reinstall packages, just update our app directory, and that should be pretty fast. However, if we change anything regarding the dependencies, then it is going to maybe recompile again and install packages again because everything from that point is going to get invalidated. So that's why ordering of the layers really matters because if we, for example, this number four, the swap then goes somewhere here under the yellow colors, then we are going to have to wait until everything is uh, recompiled and installed whenever we change a letter in our Shiny app R code. So this is how you can be smart about um, the image layers and make sure that you put things on top and in terms of the Docker file at the bottom that change more frequently and whatever is not supposed to change that frequently that can be in its separate block. And this brings us to the dependencies themselves because there are various ways of how you can install dependencies. One way is just to have a run statement with install packages or this wrapper, which is present in the rocker images install.r. You just tell it which packages to install and on its own line, that's going to happen. You can also use a description file and remotes install dapps uh, function to just grab everything from the description file and make sure that those gets installed. And some prefer to go with the rn package where you basically have a log file which tells exactly which versions of the packages R should install. And you can use rnv to restore the exact same versions of those packages and, and pull that from remotes. However, for example, the description file and the log file usually is part of the R project. So if you, for example, just copy that over with the uh, source code, then every time we update the source code, the dependency installation is going to happen again because how Docker is going to invalidate everything from that point. So it is again, a good idea to copy this log file and the description file on its own, have the installation complete, and then copy the rest of the Shiny app over. So this is the next step where we, you see here we copied something and then based on that, we had the install. Now we are copying the app directory, which contains the R source code for the Shiny app. And another thing that uh, you see quite often, but sometimes you don't, is uh, the security of uh, what a new app user will bring instead of running the container as the root pseudo user. It is a wise idea to create a user group and the user called app or, or something else, creating a home directory for that. And this is where we copy the source code for the app. Then we make sure uh, that user has the right credentials for um, owning those files and then make that user as the default user within the container. Then the only thing we have to do is expose the port where Shine is going to be running, give this command and we are done. One more tip that I can give is now, this all can happen in your local environment, but sometimes you want to integrate everything with, with GitHub or GitLab and put things in a continuous integration pipeline. In which case we might just push changes to the source code and we let GitHub action to take care of the Docker build. What happens if we are not going to have our local cache and we need to make sure if we don't want to wait like half an hour or even minutes every time we make some changes, then we can be smart about it and pick an action. For example, this Docker build with cache action version five, which on the first run is going to create the cache and then subsequent runs are just going to utilize that cache and we can have really efficient build times in that way. We have to um, specify a couple of uh, secrets for that and then we can have this event driven system where all of those new images are going to get pushed into the registry and our server or platform can 
take advantage of the latest image, pull that, run the Shiny app, and the users are going to look at uh, the, the new version of the Shiny app. So now, just to recap, these five best practices that I shared, there are lots of options out there, how you can pick or build your own base image. Uh, be smart with it because it comes down to just how long you'll have to wait and how big your image size is going to be and what kind of uh, additional steps you need to make sure that you have the right dependencies. Then you need to pay attention to these dependencies even further because depending on the base image, you might have to make sure that you have build and runtime dependencies for your OS. But if you go with uh, the Debian-based uh, apt-get approach, then that is being taken care of. So over the past two years, I'd say uh, Docker system with R have come a long ways. So things are getting easier and easier, which might be just another indication. Now is the right time to learn more about Docker and how this can make your life easier, especially in the context of hosting shiny apps. For security, it's a good idea to set a non-root user. If you also want to optimize your build times, make sure that the layers are all ordered in the right sequence, uh, depending on how often you expect them to change. And if you put this in a CI CD pipeline context, then maybe think about how to make sure caching is done so that you can save on these precious uh, computing hours and also CO2 emissions. So now going back, how this all helps us with Shiny hosting, you can see the Docker-based options uh, here in, in this uh, purplish color, and those are in the middle somewhere. So you need to learn a little. It is not as simple as clicking a button. So it's medium or slightly complex, but it also gives you a really affordable option and many different options that you can choose from. So that's why I think it is a really good idea to, to learn how to dockerize your Shiny apps because that gives you some freedoms. If you have certain boxes you need to check, which uh, the conventional hosting options are not going to provide you that easily. So with that, if you want to read more about uh, these uh, approaches and how to take advantage of Docker-based hosting for Shiny, then go to this hosting.analytium.io uh, website where I have more than 50 uh, blog posts about these topics. With this, um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, it feels quite unusual not being able to have a round of applause after the, the talks. So, uh, no, no microphones to pick up the clapping. Um, uh, we have a question from Susanna Cowton, um, who's asking if she can have the slides for this. Are they available through the site you just uh, linked to? Yes, uh, I was actually wondering if there's going to be like a video recording posted and everything. So I just didn't want to do this before the meeting, but I'm certainly going to put out the blog post with whatever uh, I'll be able to share slides or, or link to the video, those sorts of things. Yes. Okay, great. Um, Jean-Francois Ray has asked, how do you find packages uh, for system libraries and dependencies? What's your best practice to find them, for example, to use in uh, continuous integration or continuous deployment environment? Yes, that's a really good question. And, and usually, well, this might not be the best approach, but what I do is I install the R packages and then I just read the error message. And that is going to tell me what I'm missing. And those are usually pretty good in like exactly telling me what system packages I need to include. And then there might be variations. Like if you are trying to do this on Alpine Linux, then it's a bit tougher because you might maybe have to add sudo or something really trivial or just set time zone, which you wouldn't do on other OSs. But that's how I, I do it because I like to keep things minimal because if I just think, oh, I need to add these five more because I saw it somewhere else in someone else's Docker file, then I might actually add more than what's needed. So that's why I'm going with this. And then our hubs minimal example, there's actually a really smart feature where uh, build time dependencies are uninstalled at the end. So you can also get rid of some of those packages which, which you won't need to run the, the R packages, just like build tools. You can get rid of those at some point. Very thorough answer, thank you. Um, 
Jeremy Silver has asked, are there any tips to prevent the Docker container uh, built from shiny apps from exceeding the two gigabyte container memory limit? So what was that again? Are there any tips to prevent the Docker oh. container built from Shiny apps from exceeding the two gigabyte container memory limit? Oh, I see. Um, that is a hard one. I mean, I think that comes down not really on how you host it, but it's really about what your Shiny app does and what the logic, how you're handling that and really compute intensive calculations, how to push most of those to the client or how to maybe remove that from blocking your system and maybe put it in a separate process, use parallelism or like just use a database or an API. I think those would be my, my suggestions. Okay, there are still four remaining questions, but in order to reserve time for the final two speakers, I'm going to suggest we move on for now and return. Yeah, I'm going to answer them as best as I can in the chat or, or Q&A. So thank you okay. again. Thanks. Okay, now we'll move on to Jamie Lenton, who will talk about metaprogramming in R using the Gadget 3 framework. I need to unmute as well. So yes, so, uh, I'm uh, Jamie Linton. So it's, I'm a freelance software developer and I've uh, worked on a handle of things over the years and uh, do quite a bit of open source development. But in this case in particular, I was working with uh, Biaki and Will at the Icelandic Marine and Freshwater Institute to create a thing called Gadget3, which does a fair bit of metaprogramming and gonna talk about uh, why it does that, how it does that and whether it was a good idea. So something called Gadget 3, you might guess that it has a fair bit of legacy, and yes, it does. So there was this thing called Gadget, that's a marine ecosystem modeling toolbox. So the core of the idea is to model something like a record and say, OK, if we try and do this, is it actually going to be sustainable or are all records going to disappear? So it's based around several projects that have floated around to model over the North Atlantic from the early 90s. And it's open source, it's available online, thanks to our continuing efforts to use it. But uh, it's quite a monolithic C++ command line app. So text files go in and uh, text files come out and there's no kind of interaction uh, with anything else. So a lot of the uh, optimizers are written for it and there's no kind of integration with their uh, more modern tools. So this is something we're hoping to solve. And But one thing that was very much liked about it is it's very modular. So you can start off with their uh, individual species and keep on adding bits as you have time and or data. So for instance, a model might have looked like something like this, where we have two species at the bottom. So we have immature CODs and we have mature CODs. And each of those have a bunch of processes they run through. So obviously both of them grow, both of them get older, both of them die off eventually. And immature cod can mature into mature cod. And so we can keep on adding these processes as we need to. And uh, fisheries work in a similar way, except obviously they have limited abilities in comparison to the, uh, the species themselves. So our commercial fishery will come along and uh, take fish out of the ocean and uh, Finally, we'll have likelihood components, which again, we can add as many as we want based on their, uh, what that information we have. So if the commercial fishery has records of uh, the lengths of the fish it caught, then we can use that information to train the model. So each of these is specified in a, a text file. So for our immature cod, we might have a text file that starts off with this to say who it is, and then because we want it to mature into a mature cod, we'll add in the does mature option and we'll say we want the constant maturity function and give that a bunch of coefficients that we can then train. So another problem that we uh, would really have liked to solve is the fact that uh, this maturity function is just a, a name. So ideally, we don't want to go around building in any old maturity functions we ever can think of into the actual gadget source code, we like to be able to experiment with the different options without having to deal with the nuts and bolts of copying those fish from that bit to those fish into that bucket. So these were kind of the two, op two things that we we're trying to solve with Gadget 3. 
is the idea that we want to use modern tools and integrate with new stuff and use other work rather than uh, uh, doing everything ourselves and breaking out for uh, what the text file does into uh, smaller chunks that we can customize further. So this is what Gadget 3 is. So it's uh, our package for creating the gadget models, but using more modern tools. So instead of having our own optimizer, we use the TMB package to uh, take uh, the uh, objective function that uh, simulates the gadget model and then uh, optimizes it. And then we can also produce a concrete R function to integrate to other code when we need to actually uh, use this model. So to do this, instead of working with text configuration, what we use is abstract R code. So what abstract R code is in this case, this is possibly overlapping a bit with the first talk. So I'm sure you've seen at various points uh, references to unevaluated code or non-standard evaluation. So R code at its source, so you can get out the abstract syntax tree really easily. And that's one of the things I really like about R. So we can use the quote function to simply say, I want to, uh, this lump of code. Don't, don't evaluate it, just give me that lump of code. But what does it mean to give me a lump of code? Well, if we turn it into a list, we can see fairly easily that it's just a re representation of a function call. So. The assignment operator is uh, infix, which means it's in the middle, but it's still a function call. So we still say, OK, it's the arrow function call, and the first argument is x, and the second argument is y. And then from that, so uh, we can start nesting these calls to make an abstract syntax tree. So if we uh, quote this slightly longer expression, then we start seeing the nesting here. So again, we're assigning to x, so we're using the uh, arrow function, and then we're assigning 2x, but and then we're using the exponent function, and we're squaring y. So that's kind of easy. And of course, so uh, keep on adding that, the tree will get bigger and bigger. And the other concept that uh, I've just slightly reviewed with this is an R formula. So if you use uh, an R formula, then you get also get that unevaluated code, but we extend it, R extends this further with an environment. So if I look at uh, what uh, this formula is, then we see that uh, the parts was before we get some unevaluated code where we're calling the uh, hat function and we're squaring x. But we also have an environment that stored the uh, variable we set up of x equals 4. And this is kind of the core structure we use to represent the stuff in Gadget 3. So if we uh, look at uh, kind of uh, roughly the same configuration we saw earlier, but in uh, uh, Gadget 3 speak, we first off, we set up our uh, stocks. So we have an immature uh, bunch of fish and uh, they have uh, uh, lengths and we add age storage to that as well. So I won't go into that. I think there's enough time for that, but basically this is how we store our, the state of our uh, stock. So our immature ling and our mature ling are stored in these uh, two arrays. And then we have a list of actions that have what we want to happen in our model. So we want our immature link to grow. So we use the uh, action for grow mature and we specify a maturity function. And again, we're giving it to the uh, constant function, but in this case, so uh, we use another function to provide a value for that. And more interestingly, when we provide the coefficients, we provide a little snippet of our code and that's obviously we can start injecting arbitrary code into there. So that's kind of interesting and slightly more flexible than what we could do before. But more importantly, so before when we had a, a fixed choice of constants, of a fixed choice of uh, functions we could call, that G3A mature constant also then returns a formula itself. So it's then taken our uh, uh, provided uh, uh, code and mix it into its own code to then feed into Grow Mature. And Grow Mature itself then generates its own formula that's even more long, and I won't bother you with the, the code that, that ends up in. So finally, we feed a bunch of these things into G3 to TMB, which, uh, so TMB is a uh, library that uh, uh, manages uh, uh, generating uh, uh, models using uh, uh, C++ uh, uh, template function, uh, objective functions. So, it provides a fairly Irish environment 
to be able to uh, write up objective functions and then use CPPAD to differentiate them. So we have to then translate the, the, our code here into C++ to make this work. So um, that's exactly what happens. Now, I said that uh, uh, we uh, reuse formulas after the uh, to return the gadget uh, uh, options into formulae, which means we can actually provide a formulae straight into this. So instead of using the uh, uh, gadget functions, we can just give in an arbitrary lump of code. So I have my slightly boring lump of code that adds stuff to Y. And uh, lo and behold, we can see the equivalent code down here, which uh, then is wrapped in the uh, stuff you need for a TMB to then make an objective function. So how do we actually do that translation? I, that just, again, comes down to working through the uh, abstract syntax tree. So we here, uh, to look through the tree again. So we start off with the uh, curly brace. And indeed, we have a curly brace function. And uh, what a curly brace function means, as you can guess, is it just has uh, within that a list of calls, each of which represent uh, the next uh, statement inside the curly braces. So we can recurse again and say, OK, I can draw a curly brace. And then uh, uh, tell me uh, the uh, C++ for each the uh, statements within. And I'll put semicolons at the end and carry on. So we recurse down. And again, we see uh, an assignment operator, which we saw before. But so, uh, this is a slightly more con interesting example because we're adding y to y, which means we can uh, simplify the expression slightly and use plus equals instead. But again, there's a uh, call for going on the right hand side. So you just say, OK, give me the year. Uh, the cursor around again and give me whatever the right hand side does. So that's a call to the mean function. And uh, in TMB, the vector and array classes we use have uh, mean methods instead. So that translates that to a uh, uh, mean method. And then something in brackets is whatever we're applying the mean to. So and x is x. So this kind of view can carry on uh, in much the same manner. So an if statement is pretty much the same. We uh, have a call that represents the uh, bit within the uh, brackets, and we have a call which represents what we do if it's true. So again, a, a translating a, 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 less, a less than call is fairly easy, and then translating the return is pretty easy. So this kind of looks like a, a C++ transliterator. And could you use that for arbitrary year, uh, R code and to turning into C++? So I mean, this kind of comes back to the things we talked about earlier at the, in the first talk as well. So yes, it can work, but there's a few caveats, which are probably worth bearing in mind if you try to do something similar or borrow this to do your, uh, something else. So obviously, we're producing TMG objective functions, but that's partially just the domain. So this is what we wanted to do. So this is what we're doing. So there's nothing really stopping us from turning this into an RCPP function. And equally, we're using a, a TMB's vector and array classes, but we could use SDL and or we make our own wrappers that uh, will start managing that. So more interesting problems, which are, uh, is, starts becoming thorny, is typing. As you might have guessed, uh, the typing in C++ versus the typing in R is quite different. But by and large, we can get by fairly easily. So if we have uh, uh, an initial value, which is a vector, then that can be translated into a TMB vector fairly easily. And uh, uh, equally, we can take uh, uh, our initial value of y and say, uh, OK, that's a uh, uh, scalar. So we'll bung that in. But uh, notice that uh, uh, when I'm comparing it to 2000, I specify L. In uh, R speak, that uh, enforces that to be an integer. And uh, uh, then that uh, makes, means it's easier for me to translate uh, that straight over to uh, an integer of 2000. Now, why didn't I do that over here? And why to assume that's double? So if I had assumed that uh, uh, any uh, integer was going to be a natural integer as far as C++ is concerned, then we start having problems. Because if I'd say that uh, y was an integer, 
and then started adding them into that, we start to uh, lower, we start rounding down every time we added, which would then become a vastly different program to what we wanted. So then the other problem is as well is uh, so we can represent uh, uh, our vectors and decide that uh, we want them to turn into DMB vectors fairly easily. But what do we do if we have a single vector, or a vector of a single item? And that's slightly tricky as well. And I think the only real way I've got around that is by labeling it as saying this, as this we have to force this to be a vector. So the point here is, is you can't necessarily say it just translate some arbitrary code. There has to be some thought about uh, uh, whether this will make sense. And for the majority of stuff where uh, the higher level stuff going into Gadget 3, that, that's kind of fine because that's not the sort of thing you're doing. But when it comes to the uh, nuts and bolts of moving the uh, various stock around, that's when it starts becoming slightly tricky. And uh, I missed a bit. Uh, zero indexing versus one indexing also can be slightly problematic. So over here, we've managed to uh, reference the first element of X. And translating that was fairly easy because we know we want a single element, so we can use a bracket. And we know we want uh, whatever's in there minus one, and we can optimize that to zero. So that's OK. But uh, uh, what if uh, uh, this expression here was more complicated? So I can uh, uh, just negate one off uh, that all the time, but then that's what's becoming much uh, adds, adds overhead to the, the code that gets generated at the other end and adds a lot of noise. So one thing that uh, Gadget 3 does, if it sees a variable that's postfix with IDX, it assumes that uh, any kind of translation for whatever base the indexing is done in is uh, uh, already happened by that time. So it doesn't bother doing it. So it's, again, kind of ugly and assumes the code has some knowledge of what's happening or what the environment is being working in. But you can get by. And finally, this is, we don't intend to make a full uh, generic uh, transpiler anyway, because part of the point of this is to use a lot of TMB utilities that don't necessarily translate directly into R anyway. So I don't think I injected an example of that, but annoyingly, but never mind. So if I wanted to use uh, uh, any of the macros it has available to uh, I, I use for TMB reporting, then having an R equivalent to that would mean re-implementing it in R. And kind of the point of this exercise was not re-implement re the whole thing in R. So to do get around that, we have a concept of uh, G3 native, which is a function that uh, has both an R and a C++ implementation, and then you can uh, write them both, or if uh, in the case of uh, our TMB options, which don't have an equivalent, our R version just stops. So from that, we can kind of get by and uh, get around anything like that, and it's generally seemed to have worked out. So some conclusions anyway. So was this worth it? Is probably the biggest question. So versus Gadget 2. So we managed to get a lot more flexibility into it. I think that was a, uh, definitely a, a tick for that. So we also uh, now have uh, far, much faster uh, optimization because we can use the uh, auto differentiation. And we are also win against the text file configurations. So previously, we saw uh, the text file configurations having single formulae. And now we have uh, uh, formulae that are broken up into their own functions. And we've already got done this where functions have been developed outside of uh, Gadget 3 and then get sucked into uh, the core of Gadget 3 once we're actually happy with their implementation. So it's as a development model, this worked, that worked quite well. And finally, another way around this might have been making a TMB library. So instead of... Uh, uh, implementing stuff for, uh, in R, we could have made a fairly high level uh, language to sit within TMB and say, OK, at this point, grow our fish, at this point, to uh, mature our fish, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, that so, uh, it, it seemed quite attractive originally, but I think there's quite a few uh, reasons that uh, didn't really work out. So 
first off, uh, a lot of the methods are kind of intermingled. And one advantage of doing it this way is the other methods could analyze uh, uh, what's going on. So uh, uh, you can have hooks uh, uh, when maturing to see what's going on at the growth stage and then say, OK, if it's growing at this, uh, uh, can I pull out the growth rate, please? And uh, Sorry. <coughs> so anyway, sorry, I've lost my third. Uh, but that's kind of it. And uh, so the libraries are uh, open source. It's uh, uh, on the GitHub at the moment. It's not been published to CRAN. Uh, so kind of this is kind of an interesting little uh, snippet. But what might be in it for you, I guess? So. We have this framework. I mean, like I say, it was uh, very clearly developed to uh, emulate a previous uh, modeling framework. But we didn't actually mention anything uh, beyond uh, the helper functions that actually map directly to uh, uh, Gadget. So you could happily adapt to uh, what's here for other scenarios and produce, uh, use it for your own modeling framework. And there's also a lot of uh, code mangling utilities available as part of the project, which I may well break out into their own package. So uh, uh, if there is interest in that, kind of let me know. And there's some slides at the end of this if you want to have a look to show the sort of things that are available. That's excellent. Um, Thank you, Jamie. Um, I'm sorry to just interrupt you, but we're beginning to run out of time now for Alex. Um, so I suggest we also um, if you could answer the, the questions directly in the Q and A, and we just move straight on to to Alex's talk, so that he's got enough time left. Sure. Uh, and Alex is going to tell us about using Docker for data science. Okay. Thanks. Uh, hey, folks. Uh, let me get my slides going here. Share them in just a sec. Um, thanks so much. So. Oh no, um, my system preferences want to make sure I'm allowed to do this. I promise I'm allowed. Uh, I will need to exit and re-enter in just a sec. Should I answer Conrad's question in the meantime? Yeah, go for it. So Conrad answers so, uh, how I handle a variable changing its type during a program. So that's one reason we stick with the uh, try and stick with the formulas and say this is the definition of the variable's type and it shouldn't change beyond that. Hey folks, I'm back. Sorry, I apologize for that. Um, and let me now share my screen, um, which of course everything is gone from. Ha! Um, just a moment. So anyway, while it's coming up, I can talk here. Um, I'm gonna be talking about Docker for data science today. Uh, my name is Alex. I lead the solutions engineering team at our studio. Hopefully you can see my slides now and we're good to go. <laughs> I apologize for the delay. Uh, if you want to tweet at me, my Twitter is there on the slides, and this uh, will all be uh, this is all available on GitHub. Uh, the link is there at the, at the lower right of the slide. Um, if you loved Peter's talk uh, two talks ago, uh, this one may be a little elementary for you. That the idea here is to go very one hundred and one. If you found that talk a little too much, uh, this may be the right uh, the right place for you. So, so hopefully, we can talk a little bit about. We'll really talk about two things, why you might want to use Docker in your sort of data science practice. Uh, and then I'll show off a little bit of a very 101 way of, of doing it. So let's start with like, what is a Docker container? Um, a Docker container is a way to package code and its dependencies. So uh, what it allows you to do is to sort of put together the code with everything you need to run that code and, and put it in one place, which is, is very cool. It makes a Docker container very portable. Um, there was a question on here about singularity earlier. So I just do want to note that a container is a sort of more general 
kind of object uh, and just a Docker container. There are others, uh, probably the most popular of them being Singularity or Aptainer. I think they just bought Singularity. But Docker is uh, the whale in this. I know, I can tell you're all laughing. I can't see in video, but I know you're laughing. Uh, uh, in, this, in this market, right? Docker is an open source containerization platform. It is by far the biggest. And sort of do a first approximation, if you're talking about containerization, you're talking about Docker. I thought Peter teed this up really nicely in his talk. He was talking about sort of how a container fits into a deployment uh, system. And, and, and that's what I want to do a little bit of, is just be very precise about, uh, you know, where a container fits in to uh, sort of a, a deployment framework. So let's say I have an amazing piece of content, an app, uh, uh, a, a plumber API, a document that I want to share uh, with, with the world, right? I want to run it on a schedule or share it. There's a lot of hard problems that I have to solve, right? How do I give people access? Uh, you know, are, do they go to a URL? Do I give them something on their, on their desktop? How do I keep the app secure? How do I make sure that only the right people have access to the app? How do I get the app off my laptop in the first place? How do I scale the app if lots and lots of people come to it? And so, you know, Docker solves a, a small piece of this, this puzzle. Um, and, and so like, to be precise, the piece that Docker solves is the reproducibility and portability part. It solves the part about like, okay, I have an app on my laptop. I, I want to put that app like somewhere else. How do I move that app from place to place? This is the piece that Docker particularly solves. You still have a lot of other problems you might've solved about authorization, authentication and security. And, and there are other tools to do that. Some of them, uh, shared. Uh, uh, I have to say, given my day job, I'm a big fan of our Studio Connect, but there are so many options here. But Docker can be a really important part of this story. You know, lets you bundle up something you made, share it wherever Docker can run. There is one asterisk here about if you have a, a, a new MacBook, like I do, an M1 Mac, um, there are some, some limitations, although those are obviously getting worked out as Docker gets more popular. So let's talk a little bit about what exactly Docker solve. So, um, you know, I, I like to talk about this in terms of what I call the reproducibility stack, which is thinking about, you know, your, your entire app or, or, you know, whatever it is you're writing, a report, your app, um, in terms of this, this reproducibility sort of stack, which is as you go down here, and I'm going to share a bunch of things here, it gets more reproducible. So, you know, you start with your code, right? The first step is, can you share the code with somebody? Is it available? Uh, preferably in a version controlled system like GitHub, but, you know, uh, wherever you can make it available is is great, right? Level two is like the data. Can you share the data? This actually one, this one actually might be the hardest. I think this is sort of an unsolved problem in a lot of ways. But can you share the data with people? Um, can you share the set of R packages you're using with people? The R versions, uh, the system libraries that are underneath that, right? This is particularly a problem if you're doing something like geospatial analytics where you need the SF or RGDAL packages uh, and you have the, the system libraries that go along with it. Or if you're using something where you need R Java, I need the, the version of Java, Java to sort of sync up, right? The operating system, a lot of times those system libraries are specific to an operating system. And then of course, at some level, you may have the physical hardware you have to maintain. There are regulated industries where that's, that's a requirement. Um, and so, you know, as you go down this, this reproducibility stack, reproducibility gets better, but it's also harder. It's a lot more work as you go down. And so, you know, I think it's worth thinking about when you're trying to think about a project, what is the amount of reproducibility that I'm targeting along the way is a really important question. So just to, again, we're going to zoom in here, like what is the piece that Docker solves? So if you're thinking about this top part, these project dependencies, I actually think there are better solutions to these than Docker. Uh, code should go in a version control system. Data, as I said, sort of an unsolved problem, but maybe you have a particular solution. Often just saving extracts is a pretty good one. Um, I know there was a question about that in the Q&A. Uh, and then R packages, right? Uh, my opinion is you really should use something like RN to document not only the packages you're using, but the versions as well. That can be really important down the road for reproducibility. And then, you know, if you have to maintain your physical hardware, there's there's sort of no way around that. You just got to maintain your physical hardware. And uh, good luck to you with that, uh, keeping, you know, the same server running for 10 or 15 years. But this middle bit, the R versions, the system libraries, the operating system. This is the stuff where if, if this is the level of reproducibility you're targeting, Docker can be a really, really good solution. 
Um, like Peter was talking about, I, I also would recommend, you know, a server-based system, perhaps Shiny Server or RStudio Connect here, but you're taking on a lot of work to do that um, and potentially cost. And so, uh, you know, Docker can be a really great solution for this sort of middle bit of the reproducibility problem where you're talking about the R versions, the system libraries, and, and the operating system. Okay, so I, I want to show an example of how you might use Docker to do this, but, but first I want to just make sure we're all clear on, on terminology, on, on sort of the Docker life cycle, uh, you know, going from caterpillar to a beautiful Docker butterfly. Okay, so the, the Docker chrysalis, Docker starts its life as something called a Docker file, um, and, and I'll show off that in a minute, but a Docker file is simply a, a, uh, an object that explains how you create your Docker image. You then build the Docker file into a Docker image. And then you run your Docker image as a container. And so it's really important when you're thinking about Docker that you, you're clear on what happens during the build stage when you go from a Docker file to an image that then is static and immutable. And then what happens when you run the container at a later time? That's, that's sort of an important distinction that I think is, is a hard thing to click. Um, takes a while usually. And then, of course, you can store your, your images in an image registry. You can push or pull the images from that registry. If you're familiar with Git, the model is very similar. There is a public uh, registry called Docker Hub that many, many people use. Um, if you're, if, you know, depending on where you work, uh, your, your work may have a private image registry. Often people use, you know, Amazon, Google, and, and Azure all have their own private image registries that you can host. You can also host your own. Okay. Great. So that, that was just like setting the stage for like, why would you use Docker? And just like clarity around the Docker lifecycle. I want to show off real quickly two quick examples of using Docker. And, and you'll, you'll see, I, I hope, why it's compelling to use, use Docker. And then, and then show just a little bit of how you might do this yourself. Um, so I'm going to real quick switch which screen I'm sharing to make my life a little easier here. Share the screen. Probably you're seeing the like infinite regress of my screen now. Um, so let's start off, I'm gonna make my terminal big here. Let's start off by running this container that I've got. So this is, I'm gonna clear what I was doing here. Uh, this container is a container that I wrote. It contains a plumber API. So I'm going to, oops. Uh, and I forgot clean up from the last time I did this. Plumber, it helps if you spell things right. I didn't kill it yet. Okay, now it's dead. Now let's bring it back. Okay, great. Wow, that was cool. It came up really quick. This, this, this is the cool thing about Docker. Relative to, to lots of earlier sort of virtualization layers, right? The speed with which a container comes up is really awesome. As I think some people were indicating in, um, in Peter's talk or, or in, in the Q&A, right? The size of Docker containers can be a, a problem sometimes. But once they're pulled, they come up incredibly fast. And so now I've got this container up. Uh, this is a little uh, Plumber API I wrote that allows you to use the Palmer Plumber pa Palmer Penguins data set and sort of create little plots of, you know, here I have all of the penguins. Uh, I can do it with just the Adelaide penguins. Now I have that plot. That's great. If I go back over here, I can actually use Docker to get my logs. Uh, if I provide the uh, Palmer Plumber. I can actually get the logs out of what I was just, uh, you know, asking the container to to do for me, which is which is pretty pretty cool. One other thing um, I can do with Docker is to Docker run uh, dash v uh, project out Alex K Gold slash batch, and so what this is going to do is this is going to render a um, uh, 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 a Jupyter notebook, actually, this is a Python example. I know, I use our, uh, this is going to render a, a Python Jupyter example into a finished document inside a container. And I love this use case for Docker because this container can be saved and rerun and rerun and rerun forever, which is super cool. So now if I go here, that it took about 20 seconds to run, but now if I go into here, I have my little, you know, this is a, a rendered Jupyter notebook. If you haven't discovered the Quarto library yet, consider this your intro. Porto.org. It's super cool. Uh, it's sort of a next generation version of our markdown. Um, but uh, uh, this is, you know, 
um, a, a really nice way to use a Docker container if you have sort of a static asset you want to save for later and make sure you can run at a later time. I am running low on time here, but I just want to show off quickly what the Docker files here look like. Uh, you know, with just a few simple commands, right? From copy, run these commands. Uh, it's really easy for me to, um, uh, you know, to, to create this Docker file. Here I'm basing it off an RStudio plumber image that does all the plumbing so the plumber API works when it comes up. Uh, and you'll notice I, I actually just moved this here thanks to Peter's recommendation. I, I thought that was a really smart idea about copying in the project files later so that these layers don't rebuild. Uh, similarly, here's the one for Quarto. Here I'm starting for a much more basic image uh, and, you know, running some, some, getting some system things in there and copying some things in. Now, really quickly, I know we're running short on time. I am almost done here. Uh, if you thought this was interesting, thought this was cool, I am working on a book. It is at do for ds devops for data uh, It is free. There will be a print edition when I'm done. For now, uh, there will always be a free version, though, online. The Docker chapter is by far the most finished chapter. Um, and so there is, as a chapter, it includes these examples if you're interested in playing around with it. Uh, and there also is a cheat sheet at the end of some of the most useful Docker commands you, you might find. So uh, uh, hopefully if you thought this talk was interesting, but you want to learn more, I, my goal here was just to pique your curiosity. If I succeeded, hopefully you will find uh, the, ooh, infinite regress. Hopefully you will find the uh, Docker book, uh, uh, or sorry, the, the DevOps book helpful. Um, and I really welcome feedback and comments on the book. It is very much in draft form at this point. Um, Great. Elio, I apologize. I just saw your comment about asking to zoom in. I'm not sure what on. Thanks, Alex. I uh, sorry, sorry, crushed there for you at the end. I presume that um, anyone that needed to something better off will have done so. So um, why don't you answer this final question in the chat, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So um, Kobus Bosman asks, how can I use Docker in conjunction with my company's RStudio Workbench setup? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just put the link here. Somebody asked if I could share the link to the book. It's just do4ds.com. Nice and easy. Um, I'll put that in the chat. Um, great question. Um, how can I use Docker in conjunction with RStudio Workbench? So RStudio Workbench can run uh, against a Kubernetes cluster on the back end. Um, that is a really nice setup. It uses Docker containers sort of under the hood and allows you to scale out um, pretty easily. In a lot of cases, what we find is for folks using RStudio Workbench, uh, the, the Docker layer ends up being less important. Um, what you can do actually though, is you can build your own Docker containers um, and you can have, there, there's a setting in RStudio Workbench that allows an admin to allow you to pull in whatever image you want. And so uh, if you're using this Kubernetes feature, you can actually use uh, any Docker container you build against RStudio Workbench. There are some requirements there. Um, and uh, I would recommend if you're interested, you can take a look at um, what's which uh, Git repo is it? Our session complete Docker image. Uh, I would recommend you take a look at at this, um, and I'll drop the link here in the chat. Recommend you take a look at that uh, repo uh, because that will give you some some clues on how to put together a um, a container that'll work in Workbench. A few other questions, to be honest, my tell me what would happen if we carried on speaking after the session ended. Um, uh, so let's let's continue until something breaks. Uh, Tamas Sterling asks, uh, have you if we're running our strips on containers getting yeah this is uh, three to four. Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. So one of the issues here is the question of how much you're mounting into the container or putting in the container versus what you're mounting in at runtime. And so one of the patterns, and this is, for example, RStudio Connect under the hood doesn't use Docker containers, but it uses sort of a, a primitive that's the same called C groups. And so what RStudio Connect actually does is it brings up in a sandbox environment uh, and then mounts your packages, your package environment and your R environment into that from the underlying system. And so that can be a really nice way to make your container images smaller. Actually, don't put the, the packages inside the container, mount them in from an external volume 
um, and persist them sort of on the on the private server as opposed to persisting them inside the container. Um, I think that's generally a better pattern once you get past a pretty small package set, honestly. Um, I don't know if Robin has left us. Oh, cool. Well, I'll just answer Maxwell's question if anybody's out there. It's kind of hard to tell. <laughs> um, Maxwell, any resources for using Docker as a dev environment? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It depends on what you mean by using Docker as a dev environment. This is a really common pattern in software engineering. Um, I, I tend to find it less compelling in the data science world because when you're thinking about managing your packages, right, a tool like RN is really good for that. If there are particular system libraries, then maybe you want to like host RStudio server out of a Docker container. That can be a really good solution. Um, but it, it really depends on what exactly is the problem you're trying to solve. Um, I, I generally, you know, th this is using Docker as a dev environment is somewhere where I tend to see people who are new to Docker be like, Docker is amazing. It's so cool. And it is. But um, at least for data science, I tend to not see, I, I haven't seen too many really effective uses of Docker as a dev environment, as opposed to as a production sort of deployment reproducibility tool. I, I tend to see it work better in, in that um in that vein than as a dev environment. Uh, but you know, putting our studio server open source inside a, a container, totally legit, and lots of people do that. Great. Um, Jamie, Conrad, Peter, I don't know if any of you have any insight on what we're supposed to do now. I guess we just... I, I, I guess we say thank you very much and wrap up, really. That sounds right yeah. to me. <laughs> thank you so much for all of you who presented and all of you who tuned in. Have a wonderful uh, rest thank of you your afternoon. Your care and Thanks, everybody. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Take care. Bye.